Thank you. Um, so let me begin by saying that this is joint work with Alex Psomas, who's at Carnegie Mellon, Alex Kazachkov, I think is technically at Montreal currently, and then also with Ariel Pugaccia. So the question that we want to be studying here is, um, how can we fairly allocate goods that arrive over time? So instead of in one static moment having some set of goods that we have to find an allocation for, these goods will be arriving and we'll be getting more information about them as they arrive. And when I say fairly here, um, I'll be specifically refer re be referring to the idea of envy freeness, which we've been hearing a lot about today. So let me just briefly recap that. We say that an allocation is envy free if no agent prefers some other agent's allocation to their own. And if I look at two specific agents, agent I and agent J, I can say that the envy that agent I has towards agent J is the value that he has for agent J's allocation minus the value that he has for his own allocation. And when it's convenient, maybe I'll say that um, if this quantity is negative, I'll instead just say that there's zero envy, right? And as our previous speakers have mentioned, when we talk about um, indivisible goods, uh, there's a simple, some simple examples that say we should probably relax this idea to the idea of envy-free up to one good. Um, and here, just to recap, envy-free up to one good means that I'm, I'm willing to allow some small amount of envy in this system, as long as this envy is small enough so that when I envies J, there is one item in J's allocation, so that when I remove it, this envy disappears. Okay. Um, so what you should be thinking about here, um, sort of as a motivation for this problem, is some sort of a setting similar to that of a food bank. Um, say at a food bank, we have donations that are arriving over time. Um, when the item arrives, perhaps it's a perishable good, perhaps it's, it's goods that are close to their expiration date, and we have to come up with an allocation fairly quickly. We don't want to store it for a long amount of time. And also we have uncertainty about what goods will arrive in the future. Right? So we have limited information about possible future allocations that we have to make. So let's just step through this for a little bit. Uh, so let's say the first item arrives, and in this case we have only two agents, a red agent and a blue agent. And in this case, both of these agents value this item at one. Right? So let's say we just give it to the red agent. So this will cause the red agent's value for their own bundle to increase by one. And it will also uh, cause the blue agent's value for the red agent's bundle to increase by one, because they both have the same value for this item. And of course, the blue agent hasn't yet received anything, so everybody's value for the blue agent's bundle remains zero. Now the second item arrives, and both agents value this at one half. In this case, let's give it to the blue agent. Now both players' valuation for the blue agent's bundle increases to one half. The third item arrives, and now for the first time, agents value this item differently. Right? So in this case, let's make a strange decision, and let's give this item to the blue agent. Um, if we do this, the blue agent's value for their own bundle will remain the same because they don't value this item, but the red agent's value for the blue agent's bundle will increase by one. Okay, and at this point we can ask, well, how did we do? Is there any envy in the system and how much is the envy, right? So we can go look at our formula that we had earlier and we can say the envy that the red agent has uh, towards the blue agent is the value that they have for the blue agent's bundle minus the value for their own bundle, which in this case is a half, and similarly, the blue agent has envy of one half for the, for, uh, towards the red agent. So here, actually, we did fairly terribly, and we would have been better off just switching the allocations. So a little bit more formally, our model says that we have um, items arriving, <coughs> arriving online in batches of size k, and we have n different agents. We'll say every agent has a value for every item, and that these values are bounded between 0 and 1. And we'll allow these values to be chosen by an adaptive adversary. And the objective of the adversary is he wants to maximize the expected envy after we've allocated capital T items. Okay? And the expectation here is over any randomness that we may have in the allocation algorithm. Good. Of course, we want to find an, algor an algorithm, an allocation algorithm, that minimizes the same quantity. So we want to minimize the expected envy after allocating T items. Our question is, can we ensure vanishing envy after T items? And what we mean by vanishing envy is that we want the envy to grow sort of sublinearly in the number of items that we allocate, right? Another way of thinking about this is we want to say that um, the marginal increase in envy that we have on average due to any item goes to zero as our number of items goes to infinity. Okay. We look at this first when items arrive one by one, in other words, when K is equal to one. And then we'll look at it when, um, for general k, when we have t over k batches 
each of size squares. So in both cases, we'll be assigning a total of capital T items. All right, so let's start with the case where items arrive one by one. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on the upper bounds here. So let's start with a very simple algorithm. Remember, an upper bound on the NV in this case takes the form of an allocation algorithm for which we can say, no matter what an adaptive adversary does, we can provide some guarantee on the NV. So let's start with a simple algorithm and just say we're going to allocate every item completely uniformly at random, right? And let's make things even easier for ourselves and let's say we forget about the adaptive adversary for now. Instead, we're going to pretend that every item is going to be valued at one by every agent. In this case, it's not too hard to see that what we're basically just doing is we're throwing balls into bins at random, right? We have T items, we have N agents, so we expect um, the mean number of items that every agent receives should be T over N and we can bound the deviation from this mean with standard concentration inequalities. So in this simplified setting, we get the result that says the expected NV um, at after T allocations is basically square root of T over N. Of course, this is far from the setting that we actually want to study. And what's important here is our assumption that uh, these values are all one. This enabled us to use these concentration inequalities because it gave us independence between the different items that are at, right? So we need to get rid of this assumption somehow. Now, what we're actually able to show is that the optimal thing that an adaptive adversary can do against this uniform random allocation is to set every agent's value for every item to be one. And I'm not gonna be able to cover the full proof, but you basically do it in two steps. So first you show that the optimal strategy for the adaptive adversary is to set every value to be either zero or one. And then once you know this, you say, well, I'm interested in the expected envy. And um, in expectation, if the item is valued at zero, it's in ex and I'm doing things completely uniformly at random, like this never increases my expected envy, right? So I might as well set all of these values to be equal to one. And after we show this result, we're in a great position because we immediately re um, recover our previous result in exactly the same way by using concentration inequalities. And we find that when items arrive one by one, um, both with high probability and in expectation, our NV after allocating T items is basically square root of T over N. Okay, so if you think about the setting a little bit, you might realize that we can think about it as an extensive form game. So we can write a game tree where there are some nodes belonging to the algorithm with edges corresponding to allocations coming out of these nodes, and there'll be some nodes belonging to the adversary where the edges that come out of these nodes correspond to different valuations for the incoming items. And as soon as you realize this, you might wonder why is um, randomization important, right? Because we can solve this by backwards induction. So we shouldn't really get any benefit from randomization. And this leads us to conclude that there is also a deterministic algorithm that may give us, uh, that does give us the same, the same guarantees on fairness. But unfortunately, many of the, many of the obvious things you may think of trying, um, for example, greedily minimizing um, the NV after allo every, al every allocation, uh, these things fail terribly. They actually give you linear bounds on the, on the NV. Um, so what we eventually managed to do is make use of the technique of de-randomizing this, um, this randomized algorithm using pessimistic estimators. And I want to just give you a very quick snapshot of what this gives us. So we're going to get a deterministic algorithm in which we have a potential function. And this potential function will have some number of constants that are not so important for what we're going to discuss now. But then crucially, it'll have a summation of terms and each of these terms will be exponential in these pairwise envies between agents i and j. Right? So we essentially have a penalty function that says as soon as one of these pairwise envies gets too big, your penalty blows up, blows up exponentially. And then the deterministic allocation algorithm is very simple. When every item arrives, test the different allocations that you can make for it and see what is the effect of these allocations on your potential function and just choose, choose the one that minimizes the potential function. If you do this for all capital T items, you obtain the same bound on the NV that we had before, of NV being basically square root of T over N. Okay, um, we find a similar uh, matching lower bound when items arrive one by one, but I won't cover this here. So instead, let's look at the case where items arrive in batches. So just to um, remind you what it looks like here, here we have K items arriving simultaneously we see the values that every agent has for each of the K items. We somehow come up with an allocation of these items, and then the next batch arrives, right? And we'll have T over K of these batches. So to inform our intuition, let's, um, let's start with what we know. 
when k is equal to 1, we're in the setting we already finished discussing, and our enemy is basically square root of t over n. When k is equal to t, it means that all of these items arrive simultaneously, and we know that in this case we can find some sort of an EF1 allocation where the maximum NV is no greater than 1. For example, we can do it around Robin. Um, okay, and we're interested what happens for the intermediate values of k. So if we look a little bit more closely at, um, at what happened in the case when k was equal to 1, we saw that w for every item that arrived, this item caused a change in our envy that is no greater than 1. And if we look at any of the specific pairwise envies um, under random allocation, for example, if we're looking at the envy that i has towards j with probability t over n, we give the item to i, and this envy would change. And with probability t over n, we give the item to j, and this envy changes. And if we give the item to anyone else, this envy remains uh, unchanged. So with probability sort of 2t over n, this envy ij changes. But it never changes by more than 1. So you can sort of think about this as a random walk that has a step size bounded by 1, and that t takes 2t two two over n steps. And if you look at the deviation of the random walk, it sort of gives us the bound that we achieved, which was the square root of t over n. Right? So if we try and wave our hands in a similar way in the batch case, then here we see that we can still guarantee that for every batch, the NV changes by no more than one, because on this batch itself, we can find an EF1 allocation. But now it may be possible that one of these pairwise envies IJ changes in every batch, right? It, it may be the case that I always receive some item, perhaps the batches are very large. So we may have a random walk where the step size is still one, but we have T over K steps instead of T over N steps. So we may expect perhaps to get a bound that looks something like square root of t over k. And what we find is that this is in fact the bound that we're able to achieve. Um, and to do this, we'll make use of the fact that we don't really care about whether the NV changes by one every, um, every batch or whether it changes by some constant, right? So as long as it changes by some constant in my random walk interpretation, I have a constant step size and I'll be fine. So, we want to find, um, for every batch, an allocation that has a very low envy, constant envy, and that is integral. And our idea here is, to find that, let's instead look at allocations that are fractional, but completely envy-free. So I want something that's almost envy-free and integral, so I'm going to look at something that's fractional, but almost, in, um, but almost integral, and completely envy-free. And there's a result from 1980 by Stromquist that says, um, suppose n agents have valuation functions, reasonable valuation functions on the interval between zero and one, then I can cut this interval into contiguous segments so that there's an envy-free allocation of these intervals to the agents. Of course, we're dealing with, um, with indivisible items. So even though we can arrange, let's say we have three agents on, on, along a line and we have these two cuts, in some way, it's not necessarily clear that this helps us. But fortunately, what we can do is we can just say, let's arrange the, our indivisible items along this interval. And then this still satisfies the, the reasonable valuations property that the, of, um, that the agents must satisfy. And now we know that the allocation that every agent receives lies between two of these cuts. So no agent will receive more than two fractional items. And what I can do now is I can round these fractional items randomly because no agent will uh, lose out on more than two items after rounding and no agent will gain more than two items after rounding. So my change in NV after, uh, after rounding is no more than four. So this gives us a randomized algorithm. Um, but unfortunately, analyzing this randomized algorithm is fairly difficult. And uh, so, what we saw earlier was we had a randomized allocation algorithm that was just, let's just assign every item uniformly at random. And we were able to de-randomize this um, and an analyze the de-randomized one. So in this case, we'll do the same thing, even though we can't actually analyze the, the randomized one. And it turns out using the same ideas and setting up a potential function in a similar way, we can find a deterministic algorithm um, that we are able to analyze. And we, when we do analyze it, we obtain these bounds that we expect, where the NV um, for batches of size k is basically square root of t over k. Let me finish there, and then are there any questions? Any questions? Yep. So can you rapidly give me these results if rather than thinking about the randomization and I choose to inform randomizations if it's into, if I initially add this or Standard random computation or IID for all of these kinds of models, do you recover the same results or is it not clear? 
Um, yes. My feeling would be that we would get the same results because in some sense we're taking a worst case look at the, the values that are coming in, right? Um, so if those values are subject to noise, because we're taking a worst case um, look at it, we'll still be able to get the same, same results. Our algorithm would probably even be exactly the same in the deterministic case. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions?